Okay, welcome back. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of cytokines by uh, diving in and talking about two major families of cytokines that we introduced last time, the class 1 or hematopoietin cytokines and the class 2 or interferon family cytokines. So in the last lecture, we introduced ourselves to this table, which uh, listed the six major families of cytokines. Um, as I said, we're going to focus on class 1 and class 2 cytokines in this lecture. Remember that class 1 includes a huge list of cytokines whose primary uh, you know, similarities to each other are um, the fact that they share common receptor subunits. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that in this lecture. And then the interferon family, which I find a little bit more interesting, um, are major antiviral cytokines. So we'll talk about some of the major antiviral mechanisms uh, by which these cytokines function in this lecture as well. So overall, all, we're really just going to hit the highlights of these of these cytokine families. Remember, it's not really important to memorize all of the different members, um, but uh, we want to talk about things that make each family unique. So that's what we'll do, uh, and and we'll start with hematopoietin cytokines. Um, although. I want to remind you that uh, both hematopoietins and interferons have a common signaling mechanism, which we talked about last time, which was uh, signaling through a JAK-STAT signaling cascade. So um, for both hematopoietins and interferons, recall that they have uh, multiple subunit receptors, usually dimers. And when the cytokine binds, the, the dimerized receptor comes together, which brings receptor-associated kinases called JAKs into proximity. They cross-phosphorylate each other and the receptor subunits. Um, the phosphorylated subunits of the receptor then recruit STAT transcription factors. Um, when they're recruited, they become phosphorylated, which activates them, allowing them to dimerize, translocate to the nucleus, and these STAT transcription factors then promote the expression of immunological genes. And so uh, the genes that are, the specific genes that are induced by different cytokine receptors of these different families differ quite a bit. Um, but um, all of the cytokine receptors that we're going to talk about in this lecture signal basically through this common mechanism of uh, receptor associated kinases in the JAK family. Um, usually transcription factors of the STAT family, uh, and, and they induce genes which ultimately promote the effector functions of the different cytokine uh, families that we're going to talk about. So let's talk about hematopoietin, or class 1 cytokines. Uh, there are three subfamilies of hematopoietin cytokine receptors, uh, and the thing that defines each family is that each member shares a common subunit. So IL-2, 4, 7, 9, 15, and 12, uh, they all have their own individual subunits, but they can all share a common gamma subunit, um, and this influences their biology in interesting ways. Um, similarly, IL-3, IL-5, and GMCSF all share a common beta subunit, um, and so on. Uh, this, this group shares a common GP-130 subunit. Um, so what does the fact that they share a common subunit mean, and why, are, why do we care about the subunits of these different cytokines? Um, again, I want to stress, you don't need to memorize which ones go with which here, um, but let's talk about um, the way that the, the, the shared subunits influence the receptor biology. So the biggest way that these shared subunits influence the way these receptors function is that the composition of subunits influences the binding affinity of hematopoietin cytokine receptors. So under normal conditions, if we take IL-2 as an example, um, IL-2 uh, is one of the, the receptors um, that is going to share a common subunit with others in its family. Um, but under, common condition, under normal conditions, it might be composed of a gamma and a beta subunit. Um, and that combination of beta and gamma are, are going to give the receptor intermediate affinity, so sort of medium strength. Uh, and so it's going to bind to its ligand, IL-2, the cytokine, with sort of medium strength. Um, but if we uh, change the expression of subunits in the cell to now add an, a an alpha subunit, this trimeric receptor now has high affinity for IL-2. So by turning on the expression of an extra subunit, we've increased the binding affinity of the receptor such that it's going to bind more strongly to the same amount of IL-2 in the environment compared to the intermediate affinity receptor. So now the cell has much more sensitivity for IL-2 than it did before. In contrast, uh, we might turn off the expression of beta and gamma and turn on the expressions of simply of alpha. Um, and if we only have alpha, 
we're gonna have low affinity for IL-2. So this cell is not gonna be very sensitive to IL-2 even at high concentrations. So by changing the expression of these different subunits and bringing them together in different combinations, this is a mechanism by which we can tune an immune response. We can change the magnitude in ways uh, that are going to be important for determining how strong of a response we get from any individual cytokine. Um, so again, IL-2 is just an example of this phenomenon, but ultimately the receptor subunit composition for hematopoietin cytokine receptors is going to determine their binding affinity or how sensitive those receptors are uh, to be activated by a given concentration of cytokine. Um, so if we take the example of IL-3, IL-5, and GMCSF, these were um, cytokines that all shared a common beta subunit, remember. So under normal conditions, for example, a cell might express all three of these cytokine receptors, the alpha chains, um, and the alpha chains alone are probably low affinity receptors. Um, and so this makes sense. At, at rest, we probably do want low affinity receptors. Uh, we don't want our cytokine receptors activated by normal amounts of cytokines under normal conditions. But under some sort of imaginary inflammatory stimulus, we might turn on the expression of the beta subunit of these cytokine receptors and turn them now into high affinity receptors. So now they're much more sensitive to activation actually by all three cytokines. So the fact that these cytokine receptors all share a common subunit means we can turn on basically one gene, which encodes the common beta subunit, and now all three have been transformed into high affinity receptors and are much more sensitive to be activated by um, even small concentrations of each of these cytokines. Um, so this is an example of how uh, we can change uh, the binding affinity of a whole bunch of different receptors, again, just by turning on a single subunit. And, and there are multiple ways, uh, other ways that we won't discuss of, of potential regulatory mechanisms that can be invoked here. Um, these, these receptors, for example, they can outcompete each other for the beta subunit. Um, but this is really all I want to say about hematopoietin receptors. Because there are so many different hematopoietin cytokines, um, the, you know, it's, it's hard to really categorize them much further than the fact that they have this kind of neat subunit biology. Um, but there are so many of them that we'll kind of just introduce ourselves to them as they come up throughout the course. Um, but this is one feature of class 1 cytokines uh, that I think is worth pointing out as we talk about them as a family. We'll give a little bit more attention to interferons, which happen to be one of my favorite kinds of cytokines. Uh, I'm a little bit biased. I studied interferons particularly as a graduate student, and that's because I'm interested in viral diseases, and as I've said, type or all of the interferons are really important antiviral cytokines. So just like with hematopoietin, there are three major um, subfamilies of interferons. They are the type 1 interferons, type 2 interferons, and type 3 interferons. And instead of being identified by different subunits uh, that they share, uh, the different classes of interferons are identified by uh, unique ligands uh, or families of ligands. So the type 1 interferons are primarily uh, identified by receptors that are activated by interferon alpha and interferon beta, although there are others, uh, epsilon and others, but um, alpha and beta are really the only ones that you need to know for this course. They are by far the major type 1 interferon uh, cytokines. Um, type 1 interferon cytokines bind to the type 1 interferon receptor, or IFNAR, interferon alpha receptor, which is what that stands for. Notice that it is a dimeric receptor, it has a, a 1 and a 2 subchain, um, and that it has uh, familiar uh, players downstream. So it has JAK family kinases, so JAK1 and TIC2, which is in the JAK family, and it activates STAT transcription factors. So it has that same uh, overall motif that both class 1 and class 2 cytokine receptors have. So that's type 1, uh, interferon alpha and beta, um, and uh, the other thing that I want to stress about type 1 is that the type 1 interferons are ubiquitously expressed basically in all cells in the body, all nucleated cells, so everything except red blood cells. And this is important because type 1 interferons are really the prototypical innate antiviral cytokine. Uh, we need interferon, type 1 interferons in all of our cells to protect them from viral infection. Uh, so animals and humans who are lacking type 1 interferon uh, expression are really, really immunocompromised. They're really susceptible to a broad variety of, of viral diseases. We'll see why in a little bit, uh, a little bit later in this lecture. But a thing that distinguishes the type 1 interferons from the other two types are the fact that they are so widely expressed throughout our bodies, whereas the other two types um, have some restriction in their expression profiles, which make them slightly more specialized. 
So let's talk about the other types. Type 2 interferon um, is primarily um, interferon gamma and its receptor, interferon gamma receptor, IFNGR, also a dimeric receptor which signals through JAK and STAT, just like all the others. And interferon gamma, type 2 interferon, is primarily expressed by T cells. So interferon gamma, in contrast to the other two, we really think of as an adaptive immune cytokine because it's expressed by activated T cells. Um, however, it also activates uh, gene transcription in similar ways to the other two interferons and has important roles not only uh, as an antiviral cytokine, uh, but also as a, a mechanism by which we shape adaptive immune responses uh, uh, as, uh, as an effector mechanism of T-cell activation. Okay, so the last family are the type 3 interferons, which are classified at, by interferon lambda. So there are a few subtypes of interferon lambda, which you can see here. Uh, interferon lambda binds to the interferon lambda receptor. Uh, it has a, a subchain uh, which is shared with other cytokines called the IL-10 receptor, but uh, uh, ultimately uh, interferon lambda binds to what we call the interferon lambda receptor, IFNLR. It's also signaling through JAK-STAT, um, and you can see basically its signaling mechanisms are pretty much identical to the type 1 interferons. The same JAK kinases, the same combination of STAT transcription factors, Really, the only difference between type 1 and type 3 interferons, other than obviously there are different ligands, the signaling is basically identical. But instead of being expressed in all body tissues, which the type 1 interferons are, type 3 interferons are mostly expressed by barrier tissues. So things like epithelial surfaces, the skin, uh, the respiratory tract, and so on. Um, we've identified these tissues before as portals of viral entry or pathogen entry, uh, but these are areas of the body that see viruses really often because they're exposed to the outside world. So they have an extra interferon system, basically, which provides them some extra protection, some extra nuance to their innate immune responses to infection. And so uh, type 3 interferons, then, are really important for protecting our barrier surfaces from infection. That's a little bit of an oversimplification of type 3 interferon, but it will suffice for our class. In fact, type 3 interferons were only recently discovered, um, and so we're still really figuring out what makes the type 3 interferons unique and, and what their specialized functions are. Um, but, our, but our basic understanding to this point is that they are a specialized interferon type, uh, primarily at barrier tissue sites. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about interferon signaling. One thing that's unique about interferon um, and what makes it a very good innate cytokine, particularly type 1 interferon, is that it can uh, expand itself or it can amplify itself exponentially following an infection. So basically all the innate cytokines, and certainly interferon, are activated downstream of pattern recognition receptors. So if you remember way back, we talked about things called PAMPs, pa uh, pathogen-associated molecular patterns. So suffice it to say here is we're sensing a virus. We're sensing some non-self entity like a virus. It's activating one of those non-self receptors like a PRR. And uh, sensing of viruses by PRRs is going to induce a transcription factor called IRF3, or Interferon Regulatory Factor 3. Uh, this transcription factor is going to induce the expression of one of the type 1 interferon cytokines, interferon beta. Interferon beta is going to bind to its receptor, the type 1 interferon receptor, or IFNAR. Uh, and so as we saw last time, IFNAR signals through JAK-STAT signaling. And downstream of JAK-STAT signaling from IFNAR is another transcription factor called IRF7, interferon reg regulatory factor 7. And so this interferon regulatory factor is going to induce expression of a different uh, type 1 interferon cytokine, this time interferon alpha. Importantly, interferon alpha and beta share the common receptor of IFNAR, so they have the same type 1 interferon receptor. So now interferon alpha can bind to IFNAR, which is going to induce IRF7, which is going to make more interferon alpha, and so on and so forth. So here we can see a positive feed-forward loop, whereby uh, the initial production of interferon beta leads to an exponentially increasing uh, response of producing more and more interferon alpha. So this mechanism is important for creating a really fast and a really explosive, basically, type 1 interferon response immediately following viral infection. Uh, and this response is important for limiting viral infection really quickly after it establishes itself. 
So this is in contrast to the negative regulatory mechanism uh, that we discussed last time, uh, suppressor of cytokine signaling, or SOX, which will still be induced here and will be sort of working in the background to turn down the response later. Um, but this response is a feed-forward mechanism whereby a cytokine, in this case type 1 interferon, uh, positively regulates its, its expression. Um, and uh, in this case, we really need that for, for fast control of viral infection. So I keep saying that interferons are antiviral cytokines. How do they control viral infection? Well, um, almost all of the interferons, and particularly type 1 and type 3, induce a biological uh, state in the cell that we call the antiviral state, or a sort of biological environment that is really not conducive to viral replication. So uh, the secret to this are all those genes that are expressed downstream of STAT. So there are a number of interferon-stimulated genes uh, that uh, STAT activation downstream of interferon receptor activation induces. Um, so let's talk about three major mechanisms that these interferon-stimulated genes uh, induce within the cell that, that prevent viral replication. Uh, the first is the inhibition of cellular translation. So remember that viruses need to use the host machinery in order to replicate their genomes, uh, to translate their proteins, and then to package themselves back into, uh, into uh, successful particles that can exit the cell and infect new cells. So one of the ways that we can prevent viral replication is by turning off translation in the cell. So this is going to uh, also turn off the translation of our own proteins, the host proteins. Uh, but in many cases, once a cell is infected, with a virus, it's basically a goner anyway. So this is this is not uh, this is not a bad trade. Um, if we can turn off translation, we prevent the virus from translating its proteins, which is going to basically stop it in its tracks. This happens through a mechanism mediated by a, a molecule called protein kinase R, um, and or PKR. And so the function of PKR is to turn off translation broadly in the cell, which is a major antiviral effector mechanism of interferon. Another mechanism is to induce the degradation of mRNAs. So viruses are also transcribing their genomes into mRNA uh, in order to be translated. So if we create a lot of mRNA degradation mechanisms, we also can prevent viral replication that way. This happens through an effector molecule called RNase L. So RNase L is induced by interferon in cells, uh, which degrades mRNAs. Again, both host and viral mRNAs often, uh, but this is also another way that we can prevent prevent viral replication from progressing any further. Finally, there is a mechanism uh, that are mediated by proteins called MX proteins, which are very good at inhibiting the assembly of the different parts of the virus. So things like the, the capsid and the envelope, all those pieces of viruses that you may have heard about in different courses. Um, uh, but for our purposes, this really gets to the final step of viral uh, assembly, uh, which is putting all the pieces together. And so if we can block all three of these features of viral application, translation of viral proteins, transcription of viral genes, and then uh, the assembly of the different pieces of the virus into a, vi a, a viral particle, um, then basically the virus uh, has no way of replicating itself and, and finishing its life cycle. So uh, this combination of effects that happen downstream of interferon, again, we call that combination of biological activities the antiviral state, which is associated very strongly with interferon signaling. Um, and I, interferon signaling is so powerful, in fact, that we've, we've used now interferon as a, as a therapeutic option for many viral infections, and particularly uh, viral infections such as hepatitis infection. Um, and so if we just give patients type 1 interferons, um, often that really helps with uncontrolled viral infections where maybe we're not making enough interferon on our own, for example. Um, but um, I, I mentioned that um, there are two families of interferons that kind of have the same basic signaling, type 1 interferons and type 3 interferons, um, but um, they primarily differed in their tissue expression. So type 1 interferons are ubiquitously expressed, whereas type 3s are somewhat more localized to epithelial cell surfaces and barrier tissues. Well, in fact, type 3 interferons, as I, as I said earlier, are more recently discovered and um, there's a lot of effort now, a lot of work to sort of adapt type 3 interferons to be uh, actually more effective therapeutic strategies uh, compared to type 1 interferons, taking advantage of the fact that their receptors have more localized expression patterns compared to type 1 interferon. So you can think about it this way. If we treat with type 1 interferon, we're going to have really broad antiviral activity, which is great. 
But because basically we activate all the cells in the body systemically when we treat with type 1 interferon, we're going to induce a lot of inflammation. And in fact, interferon therapy, type 1 interferon therapy, is a very harsh treatment. It induces really strong fevers uh, and a lot of sickness, inflama uh, sickness associated with inflammation, uh, which gives it uh, a really uh, broad side effect profile. Um, so you, you really don't want to take interferon therapy unless you really need it, at least type 1 interferon therapy. But since we've discovered type 3 interferons more recently, uh, we, we've begun to adapt uh, type, type 3 interferon treatments in ways that um, are targeted to sites where viruses are likely to be replicating, like epithelial surfaces. Um, but because of the more localized expression profile of interferon lambda receptors, there's a lot less inflammation as a result of treatment with these interferons, and so there's a lot fewer side effects as a result. So a lot of times you can get all of the antiviral benefits uh, without all of the deleterious inflammation associated with type 1 interferons. And actually, for this reason, uh, interferon lambda, type 3 interferon, is a really exciting candidate treatment for COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, which is primarily targeted, at least we think, to epithelial surfaces in the respiratory tract, which makes it a nice target for type 3 interferon therapy. So this is one of the many therapies being developed for uh, the SARS-CoV-2 epidemic. Um, so you can uh, pay attention to that if you're interested in learning more about that. Uh, there, there certainly will probably be more developments about this in the news. Okay, enough about type 1 and type 2 cytokines. Let's summarize. Uh, Class 1 and class 2 cytokines, they, uh, as we've se seen before, they use similar signaling elements, which is why we've kind of grouped them together in this lecture. Uh, they both signal through Janus kinases, JAK kinases, uh, those receptor-associated kinases, which allow them to transduce signals. JAK kinases activate a family of transcription factors called STATs, which ultimately uh, translocate to the nucleus and promote immunological gene expression. Uh, hematopoietin cytokines, or the class 1 cytokines, uh, share common receptor chains. That's what kind of defines them as a family. Uh, they are, uh, can be divided into three subfamilies based on whether they share a common gamma, beta, or GP130 chain. Um, and a major uh, feature of, of their signaling that we described was that their subunit composition really shapes their binding affinity in ways that is going to determine the uh, ultimate sensitivity of a cell to a given concentration of a hematopoietin cytokine. We spent a little bit more time talking about interferons. We identified that they are really important antiviral cytokines, um, and we identified that there are three subdivisions of interferons, type 1, type 2, and type 3, whose primary difference was in their cellular expression. So type 1 interferons, alpha and beta, are expressed all over the body. Uh, their receptors are expressed all over the body. Type 2, primarily interferon gamma and its receptor, um, are primarily associated with T cells, whereas type 3 interferons are mostly associated with epithelial surfaces, barrier tissues. Um, and so because of that, type 1 and type 3 um, are primarily associated with innate responses, whereas type 2 is mostly associated with an adaptive response because of its association with T cells. Interferons, importantly, induce what we call the antiviral state. This is why they're so important. Um, and this can happen in both autocrine and paracrine fashions. So um, uh, interferon can signal both locally, kind of as we saw, particularly for type 3 interferons, as well as systemically, which is not to say that type 1 interferon doesn't signal locally, but because uh, type 1 interferon receptors are expressed all over the body, um, interferon signaling can also have a really strong paracrine and even endocrine fashions as well, or it can signal in those fashions. Um, and uh, the antiviral state, uh, we, de we described it as three major biological events happening. Uh, so this was the degradation of mRNA, the inhibition of translation in the cell, as well as the prevention of the assembly of viral components. And so we described three molecular mechanisms that shaped those three outcomes of interferon signaling, which together we described as the antiviral state. Okay, so that's enough for type 1 and type 2 cytokines, hematopoietins, and interferons. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about three more families of cytokines um, and some of the, the common regulatory uh, mechanisms that shape their biology and how they ultimately contribute to immune responses. See you then.